Amen. Ah, it's good to be back. Uh, I don't know about you, but I was one of the like billion other people who got COVID uh, over the holidays. Uh, but I'm good. I'm back. I'm healthy. It's back, good to be back with the spiritual family and uh, just in, enjoy this worship space together. Uh, when, I, when I got sick, uh, originally I was the only one in the household who tested sick, and so I had to do the whole sequestering from Lindsay and Kara, which is actually probably one of like, the hardest parts of COVID for me, was just being alone and separated from them. But fortunately, we live in the age of the iPhone. And uh, I know there's a lot of downsides of that, but one of the great things is like Lindsay was able to send me pictures throughout the day and videos of Kara playing and, uh, and we were able, able to FaceTime and everything like that. And th those pictures and those videos, they were a real gift during that time because I, I couldn't be with them in person. But it was nice to be able to still kind of have a taste of it, to be reminded of what I was missing and what I was looking forward to when quarantine ended and I was able to be back together with them. And then thankfully I got better and I was able to come back together with them. And guess what? In the moments when you know, we were back together and I was able to embrace them and just be with them and hang out with them, those wonderful pictures and videos that Lindsay sent me along the way became obsolete. I mean, it was great when I, I couldn't be with them to have the picture, but once I had the reality, the picture was just, it was no longer that important anymore. I had, had the real thing. I had my arms wrapped around my wife and my daughter, and the picture became obsolete. And we're here in this series that we're calling Supernatural Power for Everyday Christians. And we're working our way through Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And we took a little break there uh, over the, the Christmas season for doing Christmas series. But Justin picked up last week, again, with this series in 1 Corinthians 7. And the first part of 1 Corinthians 7, Paul, he talks about about marriage and the beauty of it, that marriage is this, this beautiful picture, a beautiful picture of a, a future reality, and it's something that's sacred, it's something that we want to affirm, and we want to pursue, and we want to cherish, and today, we're kind of picking up where Justin left off, and we're talking about this picture, and Paul wants to also remind us that it's just a picture, like that this is actually a picture from my wedding day. Aren't we so young and cute? Um, but the picture, the picture is great, right? The picture is something that's worth cherishing and, and pursuing and honoring. But at the same time, we, we got to kind of pull ourselves back a little bit. Paul, you can even get a sense that he dials back his like, enthusiasm about marriage just a little bit to remind us that marriage in this life is still just the picture, and what he says in the next thing, after kind of talking about how awesome marriage is and how we should cherish it and all of that, what he says next, he says, nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. Whatever situation. So if you were married when you became a believer, stay married. Obviously, that one's a given. He's kind of gone to great lengths. Like, if you're in a marriage, stay in that marriage. But if you're single, he says that it's also okay to stay in that situation. And, uh, and I think Paul is saying this because he knows his audience. And Justin touched on this a little bit last week. But his audience, they're there's a little bit of extremism among the group. And so for some of them, they heard like, oh, we're free from the law. So they heard, hey, we're free. We're just going to go and we're going to do whatever we want. And they kind of took that to the extreme and, and it led to all sorts of awful, weird sexual immorality and just bad stuff happening. And then there were some that looked at that and said, well, clearly the sexual appetite can lead to sexual immorality. So what we need to do is we need to go all the way over here to the other end of the spectrum and we need to get rid of sexual appetites entirely. We need to just squash them and do away with it and just live single celibate lives. And Paul's like, well, no, that's not the answer either. Marriage is really good. And he talks about the beauty of marriage as a, a picture uh, for us. And, and you can almost imagine that Paul's audience hearing this, hearing Paul talk about how great marriage is, they're all going to be like, all right, I guess we should all get married. And Paul's like, wait a second, all right? It's, it's more complex. There's more to the story. And before you kind of jump to conclusions, let's just stay put, right? That's kind of what I hear him saying. It's just like, stay put for a second, all right? Let's just consider the full picture. And he says, stay in whatever situation you're in. And then he uses an illustration. He uses circumcision as an illustration. He says, hey, some of, you, some of you, when you came to faith, you were uncircumcised. And 
He says, if you were uncircumcised, you get to stay uncircumcised. And all the uncircumcised men in the group said, amen. Uh, <laughs> And he says, were you circumcised when you came to faith? And the ladies were like, no. Uh, and half the men were like, no. Uh, and he's like, if you were circumcised when you came to faith, you can say circumcised. Like, you don't have to become uncircumcised. And I'm not, I'm not sure that's a reversal uh, operation. Uh, but of course, he's just using it as an illustration, right? He's not really talking about circumcision. He's just saying, it doesn't matter. He says whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, it, it doesn't matter. And he's kind of saying the same thing about whether you're married or single. Actually, it doesn't matter. And he says, regardless, he says, you should remain in the situation. This is kind of the point he's driving home. Remain in the situation. Wherever you kind of find yourself currently, God has you there. Just remain there. And then he gives another illustration. This time he uses slavery and freedom. And he says, some of you were slaves when you, uh, when you came to faith. And he says, it's okay. You don't have to worry about being free. He does actually add in there. He's like, if you can get free, do it. But like, it's not that big of a deal. And if you are free, don't like let yourself get into slavery. And he says the same thing again. He says, brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Is he talking about slavery and, and freedom? No, he's using it as another illustration because he's talking about marriage and singleness. And I think he uses the second illustration of uh, slavery because he, he can say that, you know, whether you're a slave or you're free doesn't matter. Uh, but at the same time, if you're a slave or you're free, it's going to be a radically different experience in life, right? You can't, you can't even compare the two lifestyles between a slave and a freed person. So when Paul is saying it doesn't matter whether you're slave or free, he's not saying that your lived experience is going to be the same thing. But he is saying that that doesn't define you. It's not your identity. It's not your, the, the core center of your personhood. And, and is he talking about slavery and freedom? No, he's actually talking about marriage and singleness. And he's saying it actually doesn't matter. Yes, your lived experience, how you experience life is going to be radically different if you're married and you have kids versus if you're a single adult. Radically different. But it's, it's not who you are. It's not your core identity. It, it doesn't actually matter that much for your purpose in life. It's going to change radically again. It's going to change your lived experience. But it's not going to change who you are in God's economy. And even how the core of how you relate to the church and the community of faith. And so he can say, guys, actually just stay put. Don't jump to any conclusions. You don't have to rush to get married or rush to stay single. You just stay where you are. And let's consider the options here. Remain in the situation. And this is, this is shocking. Even today, this is a little bit shocking because, you know, even in our culture, uh, we tend to uh, identify ourselves and find our identity in our relationship status. And Paul's saying, well, that's not actually the core of who you are. And if, it, if it's that way today, it was that much worse in the first century that marriage and family and all of that, and like as a woman being able to have kids, like all of that was so much wrapped up in your identity and your worth and your value in the first century. And Paul's saying, actually, in God's economy, that's not where your value and your identity are found. So you don't need to think about those things for the, the core of who you are. And then he goes on to say, now about virgins, when he's, he kind of replace virgins here for single adults, all right? Now about single adults. I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Justin touched on the phrasing of this a little bit last week, and I just want to uh, cycle back to it, because we could read this, and when Paul says, I have no command from the Lord, I give a judgment as one who's trustworthy uh, by the Lord's mercy, Paul is not saying, hey, this is just my opinion that you could take it or leave it. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying like there's this parenthesis in the inspired word of God that like what he's about to say is no longer inspired by God. What he's saying is when he, he doesn't have a command from the Lord, he's saying that this isn't something that Jesus himself explicitly said in the flesh during the incarnation, all right? He's, but he is taking the life and teachings of Jesus and he's extrapolating that out using the Spirit of God to make a, a judgment which is still inspired by God. And actually, the end of this pa passage, Paul closes it by saying, in my judgment, I think that I too have the Spirit of God. So when Paul says, 
I'm making this judgment. It's not a command directly from Jesus. He's not saying that this, this is not part of the inspired word of God. He actually is saying quite the opposite. He says, I believe this is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it is the result of the, the life and teachings of Jesus. But here's what he says. He says, because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain. That's that, that word again, remain as he is. He says, are you pledged to, be, uh, pledged to a woman? Like, are you engaged? Don't seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? He says, don't look for a wife. But if you do marry, you haven't sinned. And if a virgin marries, she hasn't sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. All right. Now, here we get Paul for not the first time, all right? This is actually not the first time even in this passage where he's actually suggesting that if you are single, that remaining single might be the better option. All right. He actually, he says it, uh, First, back in verse 7, he says, Now to the unmarried and the widow, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. And even later in this passage, he says, So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. He, even, he doesn't just say that it's good to remain single, but that it could even be better in certain scenarios to remain single. And then he, he uh, closes out, he says, In my judgment, she, this single woman, is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I too have the spirit of God. He uses not just that it's good, but he even uses the language of, of better and happier in this context. And for me, it just doesn't feel right. <laughs> like I don't, I don't expect Paul to say that, I don't want Paul to say that, but Paul's not, not alone in making this kind of insinuation. In fact, there's a, a moment in Jesus life and teaching where uh, somebody came up to him and asked him about like marriage and divorce. And they were like, why did Moses allow us to divorce? And Jesus says in response to that, he says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your, heart, your hearts were hard, right? It's, that was your problem. He says, it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for uh, sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So the, the disciples, they hear this kind of very narrow and high teaching of marriage and their response to this is to say, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a, a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry, right? Jesus, like elevation of marriage and, and even talking about like what divorce and remarriage looks like and all of that, the response to that by the disciples is, it's better to not get married. Now, what do you expect Jesus to say to a statement like this? Like if the disciples came up to Jesus and was like, ah, I think it's better for people to not get married. What I expect Jesus to say and what I want Jesus to say is, no, 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 guys. Marriage is great. It's this wonderful, wonderful picture of this future reality. And, you know, anybody who can, everybody who can should just pursue it and embrace it and cherish it and all of that. Uh, that's not how Jesus responds. Look at how Jesus responds to this. He says, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. Super cryptic. But he's saying like, actually, maybe for some, that's true. He says there are eunuchs, right? People who live celibate lives who are born that way. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by other people. And then there's the third category. Says, there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And look how he closes. He says, the one who can accept it should accept it. Like, that's a lot of weight there. He didn't just say, for the one who can accept it, it's a, a viable option. He actually even puts a little more weight behind it to say, I actually recommend, if you can do it, to, to try and do it. Which sounds a lot like what Paul is saying here. He's not saying that, you know, singles can't get married. He never said, he actually says quite the opposite. He says, it's still okay to get married, but... If you are able to remain single, there's something good about that. That it's a, there, there's a gift in that. Now, this is not a, a kind of topic and teaching that gets a lot of press in churches. And in, in my experience, when I've heard this talked about, so often we try to qualify Paul's statement and like add all of these kind of disclaimers, qualified to the point where we actually undermine it entirely and we forget, we actually lose sight of what Paul's trying to say, that singleness is a gift from God. 
like a, a gift that is worth cherishing and pursuing and encouraging. And it, it's a gift to the community of faith. It is a gift to those who are singles. It's like a beautiful gift from God. And in all the same ways that marriage, the picture of marriage is a gift to us in the church, singleness is also a gift. And he's saying, we, we should cherish this. And for some, we should pursue it. And as we, we talk about this today, uh, for some of you, you're single adults, and so you say, all right, so maybe this applies to me. Some of you are saying, like, I'm married, that ship has sailed, so I'm going to tune out. Don't tune out, all right? Because if, if this really is a gift, if singleness is a gift to the community of faith and to the kingdom of God and to individuals who embrace it, then it, it means for single adults, we want to make sure you don't squander this gift, but for the rest of the church, we want to make sure that we're not squashing this gift in other people. That we, as a community, we are also embracing and cherishing this gift. We're actually creating an environment where this gift can be fostered and nurtured and encouraged and all of that. And so as we, we look ahead to what Paul has to say here, this is for all of us, right? This isn't just information for, for single adults who are in the room. I think this, there's something in here for all of us to be paying attention to because it's a gift, Paul says, what I want to do is I want to look at uh, the, the reasons why Paul says it's a gift. There's, there's two uh, things that he points to, two realities of the current world and marriage in this world that he says are, are reasons why singleness is a gift. And he points to the present crisis, right? He says because of the present crisis that they were living in, uh, he thinks it's good to remain. And he says that those who marry will face many troubles. So there's the present crisis and the many troubles. So let's start with the, the present crisis. Now, Paul never uh, identifies what the present crisis is. A lot of scholars, they believe it might have had something to do with a famine that was starting in that time, or maybe it had to do with the, the persecution of the church that was starting to build in those days in the first century. And so most scholars believe there, there is something particular about the present crisis, that it's, it's not something that's general to everyone. There, there were particulars about it that were unique to the first Corinthian church, all right? And if, if he just left it at that, we could say, well, maybe his recommendation for singleness is unique to them in that particular period of time. But Paul goes on to say something. He says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is, can I just tell you how much I love when I'm reading something in the Bible and I'm like, what does he mean by that? Like, I have a question. And then the next thing I read is, what I mean is, and he offers up the explanation. So he says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as though they do not, and those who mourn as if they did not, and those who are happy as if they were not, and those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, and those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world, in its present form, is passing away. When Paul talks about the present crisis, he, he is talking about their particulars, but he's actually, he, he's talking about something much more broad, uh, which is that, that the time is short and that the world in its present form is passing away. And what Paul is doing is he, he's actually drawing their attention out of the current temporal world to eternity and reminding them, hey guys, our time here is short. And this is just as true for us today as it was for them, that we live in what is often referred to as the church age. It's the time between when Jesus ascended to heaven and he poured out his spirit on the church and the time when he's going to return and he's going to come and welcome us back. So we, we live in this time between times and it's a time that's short. It doesn't feel short. You know, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus departed. Uh, and, and even our, our lived experience of it doesn't feel short. It's 60, 80, 100 years uh, on planet Earth. It feels like a long time. But of course, in light of eternity, it's a drop in the bucket. And Paul is, is drawing our attention out to say, guys, the time, the time is short. I know it feels like a long time, but the time is short. And if, if singleness is better for anybody it's in the context of eternity, right? He's not saying that singleness is necessarily going to be a better experience in the temporal world, but for those who can and choose to embrace it, in, in eternity, it can be better and even be, be happier. And 
He, he goes on to say, from now on, look what he says, from now on, those who have wives should live as though they do not. He's actually talking to married couples here, right? Now he's not talking to the singles. He's talking to married couples saying, hey, those who are married actually live as though you don't. Now, we have to take this in context, all right? He's not saying that we should disregard or neglect our marriages. He's not saying that. We know he's not saying that because he already talked about making sure we're attending to our marriages, right? So there's a little bit of hyperbole here. But what he's saying is, guys, don't, don't live your life as though your, your marriage and your relationship status is what defines you. And, and don't engage in your faith as though your, your marriage and your relationship status and your family is the whole reason to engage in faith. Because, of course, marriage is temporary, you know this, right? Marriage is not eternal. Like, I'm not going to be married to Lindsay forever. Jesus actually said there's no marriage in heaven. It's, it's just a picture. It's just the placeholder. It's something that's pointing ahead to a future reality. It's just the picture, and the picture is, is it's in this present form. It's passing away. It's not eternal. And so I, I think for us, we who are married... We have to remember this because it's easy for us to make our whole world about our, our, our spouses and our children and, and our whole engagement with the, the body of Christ is kind of centered around our marriage and our family. But if that's true, like if our, our whole interaction with the church and with Jesus, our relationship with Jesus is all centered around our relationship uh, with our, our spouse or our, our kids, well, that would mean that the core part of how we relate to each other and to Jesus is going to be stripped away for all of eternity. Because you're not going to be a, a wife or a husband or a father or a mother for eternity. This is just a temporary placeholder, right? And, and we can easily get sucked into even just our engagement with the body of Christ uh, and it being all about our our families, and we only kind of do it as a half of a, a spouse or part of a family. And, and I think there's no better way to make single adults feel like they are something other, something kind of as a, a second tier part of the community than when families and, and married couples treat their whole experience in church life as like a couple's thing. And it's all about their marriage and it's all about you know, us doing it together. And, and I just want to be clear. Jesus needs to be the center of your marriage. Jesus needs to be the center of your family. But your, your marriage and your family shouldn't be the center of your relationship with Jesus and the church. Because they, they won't be for all of eternity. Because you're not going to be a spouse or a parent for all of eternity. You're going to be a son or a daughter. You'll be a brother or a sister. That's, that's your identity. And that's what he, he's pointing us toward here. He's helping us recontextualize even the, the idea of marriage and family in relationship to eternity. And then he talks about these, these many troubles. And Paul is being really, really practical here when he talks about the troubles that come with marriage. He's not channeling like his inner Jay-Z. He's not like, uh, you know, got girl problems. I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a wife ain't <laughs> one. Uh, that is not... <laughs> That is not what he's saying. Uh, he's being really practical. Like, of course, marriage and family, it's work. There's challenges that come with it, and so that, that's part of it, is just the challenges of maintaining those relationships. But even beyond that, the moment you get married, your problems double. Uh, not, I mean, not, not because of the relationship itself, but you just added a second person, and all of their problems are now your problems as well. Like, it's just the, the way it works. Like, when your spouse is going through something, like, now that's your problem, too. Like, there's twice as many opportunities for problems. And, of course, you know, in the first century, even more than today, but still today, the expectation is if you do get married, that there's probably going to be kids. And then those problems, they just, they just keep going. You know, you throw kids in, and, like, man, the crap you have to deal with. I mean, like, literally, like, the crap, like, the poop that I have to deal with. Like, this is not part of my world until kids came into, uh, you know, like, last night. I woke up at, like, 1 in the morning because Kara came running in, leapt into bed. She had, like, a bad dream or whatever. And she's, like, ah, freaking out and all of that. And, you know, of course, you know, I care for her and all that. I'm also thinking I have to get up in a few hours and I have to preach. Uh, <laughs> but, like, these are, these are troubles that exist that don't exist if you're by yourself, 
life. You kind of have that, that freedom and autonomy. Now, you ask almost any parent or spouse, and they will tell you, yes, there are troubles, but we would also say it's worth it. Right? We'd say all the, the pain and the hardships and all of that, is, it's made worth it because of the experience of being a spouse or a parent and the joys that come with it. And that's, that's true. Uh, but all of those joys and those rewards that we get, Paul is reminding us, those are temporal rewards. He's actually trying to point us back again to an eternal reality. And look, he goes on to say, I would like you to be free from concern. Concern here, he's, he's talking about the troubles, right? He's talking about the things that occupy our minds. They use our emotional energy. They, they require the resources in our lives, the things that we're concerned about. He's trying to say, I want to free you from some of these concerns. He says, an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he will please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, happy wife, happy life. Uh, and his interests are divided. Now, my interests are divided. As a married man, my interests are divided. And that's, he, Paul's not saying this as a, an accusation for people who have their priorities out of whack. He's not saying like, oh, some people idolize their marriage and their family. And that's true. That's a whole different thing. But he's actually talking about, like, legitimately, if you're doing marriage right, your interests are going to be divided. Because there are problems that come up. There are responsibilities that you have. You just don't have the time to do all of those things that you used to do. And he goes on to say, an unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs, and her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. And I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Undivided devotion. There's this opportunity for singles to be undividedly devoted to the Lord where couples and people who have families, they're restricted. There are divisions. They're, they're not bad divisions, but they're just divisions. Leading up to Christmas Eve, uh, we had like that whole week. We had rehearsals every night, and it was like really long days. And there were a couple days there where I left the house in the morning before Kara woke up, and I got home well after she went to sleep. And, uh, and going through that week, I was like, it's fine for a week. Like, I could do this for a week here and there. I can't do that every week. That, that would actually be irresponsible as a husband and a father to live that way, but it also reminded me of the old days, like before I met Lindsay, when I was working for Beacon, I could do that all the time. Like I was just uninhibited from just kind of pouring my time and energy into the kingdom and meeting with people and trying to spend time with lost people and trying to do ministry stuff. And, and there's a very real sense, Paul is actually pointing out in a very practical sense, if I stayed single, if I had remained single, unmarried, no kids, I actually... I probably could have done more for the kingdom. I actually probably could have done more for Beacon. Like you, you probably could have benefited from me staying single. I probably could have discipled more people. Our disciple ministry would be stronger. It would have more going on. It would be more organized. The fusion kids, when I was doing that, I'd probably have more time to spend with them and build into them. Like there's actually like legitimate, practical kingdom things that could have been done if I remained single. And that's all Paul's pointing out is that for some, if you have the ability to do this, why not do this? Why not do this? And it's easy to think like, all right, so some of us are being called to singleness because what we're being called to is to kind of like take one for the team, right? All those married people, they get to enjoy this life, get that picture, that nice little picture of what eternity is going to be like, but us, you know, single people, we're going to take one for the team and the church is going to benefit off this. But look what he says. He says, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you. That he's offering this to single adults for their benefit, for their joy, not just for the benefit of the community. His mindset here isn't that like, oh, you're taking one for the team. And Paul, by the way, Paul was a lifelong bachelor. He's He's somebody who put his money where his mouth is on this. He actually believes it's for your benefit. And I believe him because one day I'm going to stand before Jesus. And in that day, I will not be a husband or a father. 
And in those moments that I'm standing before him, I don't think I'm going to like be thinking about, I don't think I'm going to be thinking about all the memories I made with Lindsay and Kara and the unnamed baby boy that's coming in June. I don't know if you heard. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yay! Uh, <clears throat> one more division. Uh, <laughs> but I, I actually, I, I don't think in the, that moment when I'm standing before Jesus, I'm going to be thinking about any of that because in that moment when I'm standing before Jesus, everything that marriage and family pictures everything that this is a a picture of will be swallowed up in the reality. See, this is what Paul presumes his audience already knows, and I hope you know. You guys know what marriage is a picture of, right? It's a picture of of eternity. That you, You get to the end of the book, you get to the end of Revelation, and us being united with Christ in eternity, it's actually pictured as the marriage supper. That marriage in this life is supposed to be a picture of that future reality. And I don't know about you, but it's very hard for me to try and wrap my mind around what is eternity going to feel like, like being in heaven? Like, what is that going to feel like? I can't. Like, it's going to be happy. But here's what I can sink my teeth into. I know what it, what it looks like to experience the, the joy of companionship and intimacy. And even if, even if you don't experience that, even if, like, you're a single adult, you can actually just because of seeing marriages around you and even the longing in your heart that maybe some of you feel, you can appreciate what that would feel like and all of that God has given to us to point us ahead to that future reality. And so maybe maybe some of us will experience that picture here in this world, but all of us who are in Christ are going to experience the reality that it's pointing to. And that reality is going to be so much richer, so much greater, that we won't even think about the picture anymore. It'll be obsolete. Because it just isn't that big of a deal. It's, it's a thing of the past. It was a placeholder that the reality has now eclipsed entirely. And so in that moment, I'm not going to be thinking about the memories I had as a father and a husband and be like, oh, glad I got to do that. No, what I'm going to see is I'm going to look around. I'm going to see other faces standing at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what's going to make me happy is the people that are standing there with me on account of the life that I got to live. And what Paul is saying is that for, for some who are called to singleness and single adulthood, you have the opportunity to put more time and energy and investment into seeing more people at that marriage supper in a way that I, I can't. It's not a bad thing. He's not saying it's sinful for us to be married or anything like that. But man, it's a really good thing when people are single in the kingdom. It's a, it leads to really good opportunities. I want to stress the opportunity. Because it's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee that if you're a single adult and you're a Christian that you're going to do anything more for the kingdom. Right? It just means that there's the opportunity for it. And this is the question that I want to leave you. If you're a single adult, this is the question I want you to, to kind of wrestle with. All right? I want you to ask, are you squandering the gift that you have? Right? The, here's, this is the question that I don't want you to worry about right now. I think a lot of times we read this, and if you're a single adult, the question you start to ask is, am I called to singleness for the rest of my life? And that is an important question. You can wrestle with that another time. But don't get distracted by that question. Because if you're a single adult right now, you have the gift of singleness right now. You might not have it two years from now, but you definitely do have it right in this moment. And in this moment, are you squandering it? About a month ago, I was in small group, and uh, Davin is in my small group. Davin is back there running cameras. Everybody say, hi, Davin. Uh, Davin, you know, he's one of the first people here on a Sunday morning, helps with our production team. He's going to be one of the last people to leave today, and then he's going to go grab lunch, and then he's going to come back for like four hours for Fusion uh, tonight, and he serves throughout the week, and he's, you know, he's the, the kind of guy who like took his vacation time over the summer to lead the mission trip, and then took more vacation time to help run production for the Christmas Eve service. Uh, and Davin, about a month ago in small group, he, we were talking about gifts that we have from God, gifts that we can use for the kingdom, and he, he chimed in. I was just blown away by his mindset. Davin's 25 years old, single at the moment. Uh, He doesn't know if he's called to singleness, actually hopes that he's not, but he realized how much of a gift it is. And he he chimed in, he says, right now I have the gift of time. 
I realized that God has given me time and availability because I'm single, I have a job that's not all consuming, I have resources, I can, I can actually serve. God has given me this ability right now. And he is, he's jumping on it. And he, we were even hanging out the other day and he was talking about how for a long time he saw his singleness as like a, a curse, like a burden that God put on him. And he just wanted to get out of it. And, and he, again, it's not that he's going to stay single forever, but he realized right now God has given him a gift. And he's using it for the kingdom because he knows it's producing an eternal reward. And so I want to encourage you, if you are a single adult, are you squandering that gift? Because it might not last forever. And I've seen, I've seen some single adults do more in like a few years of their singleness than in like the next few decades of them being in marriages and families because your interests are divided. So if you are single, embrace it. Cherish that gift. Now to the, the couples, the married couples in the room, I want you to ask yourself, Am I squashing this gift? Are we creating an environment that is squashing it? And there's a couple of ways that we could do it. I think there's a lot of ways, but a couple of examples of how we could do this is, one, we could we kind of treat singleness as a problem that needs to be fixed urgently. Like our single friends, we're constantly trying to set them up with, or we're trying to like point out, well, oh, she looks good. What about him? Have you considered this? And we're, we're constantly trying to you know, fix this problem of singleness. And singleness isn't a problem. <laughs> It's a gift. I think another way that we could do this uh, un unintentionally is we can create kind of artificial barriers. I mean, we don't do it intentionally. I think it can happen accidentally. But artificial barriers in community where single adults get to have community with, like, other single adults and maybe people of, like, the same gender who are married on occasion. And, and it's just a limited sort of community. And I remember, I was, even as I was prepping, I was thinking back to when I was a single adult. And some of the richest experiences of community I had as a single adult were not just when I was hanging out with my guy friends. That's great. There's a place for that. But I had some friends that were married and even had families. And they would, like, regularly invite me into that world. And I got to hang out with them and their spouses and their kids. And that's a different kind of community. Like being a part of a family like that is different. It's richer. And I think if we're not careful, single adults in the church don't get to be a part of that. Uh, they get to, you know, maybe have one-on-one -on -one time with a guy friend or they get to hang out with the other single adults. But there, there's like a part of the community that they don't get to experience because we're, we're not being intentional about it. And that was probably one of the biggest takeaways for me, even as I've been prepping. I'm thinking, I want to have a seat at my table, at my dinner table with my family, the, the people in my small group, the single adults in my small group. I want to be more intentional about just having them over, bringing them into that experience of community because this is the kind of community that I think will foster people who will not squander the gift people who embrace that gift and be able to use it for the kingdom. This is what I think allowed Paul to be able to live the single life and joyfully do so and to just pour himself into the kingdom because he had this kind of community. If you get a chance, go and read Romans 16. It's the end of Romans. It's one of those passages you just kind of read past because all Paul is doing is saying like, oh, say hi to so-and-so and this person, this person, this person. But go and read it because it's really fascinating because you'll see he says hi to women and men and married couples and entire households, and you see that Paul had a, the fullness of community. Because even though some people might be called to singleness, nobody is called to aloneness, and nobody is called to isolation. We're called into the, the fullness of this community, and I think by embracing single adults in the fullness of community will bring a joy in this life to sustain them, to be able to do this kingdom work that God is, is actually gifting them with the time and the availability to do. And there's a day where hopefully all of us are standing before Jesus, not as fathers or mothers, husbands or wives, but simply as brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. And I think we're going to look around and we're going to see some faces there that are there because... The gift of singleness was fostered in this community and single adults were able to take that gift and run with it and do eternal kingdom good with it. But So I encourage you, let's, let's be a kind of community where this gift can flourish 
or it can be treasured and even pursued.